What is up, you guys? This is Gene Jensen, and I have got a treat for you today. It's all about glide baits. First of all, I'm going to be the one that admits that I suck at glide baits. I'm not good at it, so I got us an expert right here. This is Austin Neary. What is up, everybody? And, Hope you guys are doing well. And Austin comes to us from the uh oh crap what's your youtube channel dream catchers dream catchers fishing, fishing that's yep. right and he also has a tackle shop here in north carolina that's right we're at some remote lake in north carolina and i'm gonna let him talk about all that but what we're gonna do with this video is i want i mean it's gonna be like a an interview question q a we're gonna go through the details of of fishing glide baits how these guys are doing it the rods the reels the line the the different baits secret tuning secret tuning all that stuff that you don't find in any other video on youtube and i'm basically going to force all the information out of his mouth he better have a gun <laughs> i'm excited about it i'm all about education all right so let's jump in there and, and get things rocking and rolling all right austin yeah. give up the juice <laughs> all right well gene asked me to spill the beans on everything that I do glide bait. And I've been a fishing guide in Western North Carolina for a decade. And I was inspired by a video called the Southern Trout Eaters. And I'm like, holy cow, there is a unbelievable big swim bait bite in our region. But man, the world of swim baits has evolved just literally so much, even since I first got into it a decade ago. But there's a few things that are fundamental foundations. Like we need to get foundational principles down when we start talking about swim baiting. The first misconception that everyone has is that you must be fishing for giants. And the reality is, yes, you always have that potential when you are throwing big swim baits. But the reality is bass do not have a mirror. They don't know how big they are. If I was going to go pick a fight with Shaquille O'Neal, I have the cognitive ability to look at myself in the mirror and say, okay, I'm a six foot three, 210 pound dude. Shaq's seven foot four, about 400 pounds. He's going to kill me, right? <laughs> bass, bass don't think like, oh, I can't, I can't eat that. It's too big. They don't think like that. They are purely instinctual feeders, right? So when I think about targeting bass, they are most susceptible to eat what? Bait fish. So it doesn't matter what size the bait fish are. If they think they can handle something, they will try to eat it, right? Eating. When I think about swim baiting, I think about the ability to move fish, draw fish. That's why I'm a big fan of plus size swim baits. Naturally, the bigger swim baits you throw, the more water they move. The more water they move, the more followers you get. The more followers you get, the more bites you get, the more bites you get, the more obviously you have the chance to, to land more fish. Question. Yeah. So with the big fit, with the big baits, yeah. okay, you do get a lot of followers. Yes. So it, it's a lot of times it frustrates people that, that they're getting followers and not a lot of 100%. bites. 100%. But explain more about how you, how you deal with the frustration of, okay, I get a bunch of followers. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So there's a couple things. When I think I'm getting followers and purely just followers, there's two things that I really think about. One is maybe my presentation is not exactly what they want. So when I think about swim baiting, uh, and it would actually help if I have, well, here you go. I'm going to open your box. There's multiple actions of swim baits, right? So here is a bull shad, and this is a serpentine uh, a serpentine action bait, right? So it swims very serpentine, right? This isn't a glide bait where a glide bait has a single joint that cuts from side to side, right? A glide bait goes, woom, 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 woom. I like the sound effects. That's great. You like that? Yeah. I don't, I don't know what's up with that. But you have different actions. So if I'm getting a follower, sometimes they just want a different action. Sometimes they do want a different size profile. But one thing is if they follow, they're moderately curious, hungry, or territorial, right? So what I'm going to do, anytime I get a follower, I do what's called a do or die. And that is essentially, they're following, they're following. I want to see how serious those fish are. And what I'll do is I'll literally take that bait and go, hoo, 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 and I'll pull that bait as fast as I can away from that fish. And that's going to either get them to be like, uh, that thing's cracked out and I don't want to chase it. Or they're like, oh, it's fleeing from me. Yeah, and I naturally it. It, it enacts their competitive yep. feeding brain and they want to come up and smash it. So when the biggest mistake, oh my gosh, I see this guiding. I mean, we do about 350 trips a year between me and our other guides, the biggest mistake I see our guys make is they get a big follower and they just go like this, oh, 
<laughs> and they freeze. And I, I'm like, the fish are literally, they're, they're swimming, they're swimming, they get the follower, and then they freeze. And the fish is like, whoa, that's not real, right? Because, and I tell, listen, if I could talk to bait fish, I would tell bait fish, don't swim faster from a big bass, just pause. Because <laughs> ba big bass don't like when it pauses. So right now, where I am in Western North Carolina, it's really unique. The water's actually still in the mid-70s. It's kind of at the end of summer here. But our fish are up shallow they're on points they're on brush they're feeding pretty heavy in fact as we sat the boat down to do this interview there come a big small mouth up feeding on some herring but this time of the year when i think about late summer fall water bass eating they're eating walking baits right so something that's zigzagging really hard <laughs> so what we're going to be using today are chop style glide baits and this is a uh, clutch darter. This is an expensive bait. This is a $250 bait. You might think I'm crazy, but this bait is worth it. Be crazy. But uh, I was showing Gene last night at the house how many teeth marks are on this bait. But this bait literally is just a big underwater walking bait, right? So Herring what imitator? makes it a chop style bait? Okay, great question. Man, Gene, that's what's that's next level. Look at that. <laughs> look at that giant angle. Hold on, I'm going to zoom in. Hold it still. Yep. Okay. So look at that giant angle and then look at that angle. So this is a Depths 250. This is a traditional first, you know, a glide bait. The Depths 250 might be the most recognizable glide bait of all time. But you can tell this bait here is made to slalom out like this slide, mm. slide. And that's why it's called the slide swimmer, right? It slides, but it has that slalom. Where this bait, because of that angle, it literally turns on itself because of that hinge. That hinge is so free. So you have a super chop style bait. The Depths 250 is a glide bait. I'm going to show you guys a, probably my favorite swim bait of all time is this DRT Clash 9. This is actually a custom color that we have coming out in brown trout. Not many baits come out in brown trout. Mm -mm. So we're doing a brown trout colored in our herring lakes. That's actually what the government stocks. But once again, what, what kind of glide bait do you think it is? It's a chop style glide because of that big angle. This bait literally whew, turns on itself just like that. And I can walk that bait so many times when I'm, fish, when I'm fishing a specific piece of cover with a glide bait and even a serpentine bait, I've, I've got to keep that thing swimming to keep it going or it sinks, right? Well, with the chop style baits that have that slow suspending action, I can chop, 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 chop and leave it there and it drives the fish crazy and you can work the bait, you can get more of those tight actions in a smaller window, which really creates reaction strikes around cover, which is what we're gonna be doing today. That's cool. That's yeah. cool. So, so that's always been the confusion for me is, is choosing the right so bait let's, and let's understanding. Talk, what let's talk about are. seasonally choosing the right bait. Okay, cool. When I think about winter fishing, I always try to apply my swim baiting to my conventional fishing, right? So naturally, how in the world am I catching fish in the winter time? Dead of winter, cold, the fish are lethargic, they're laying on the bottom, right? I think about dragging a football jig. I think about maybe a jig and spoon. I think about uh, an underspin. So it's slower moving baits. Well, naturally, I'm gonna go to slower moving swim baits, like a, like a Huddleston or a Defiant or something that has a wedge tail, a soft swim bait that I can fish really slow on the bottom and has a super simple action. Just like um, uh, an underspin or a football jig has a super simple action in the winter time, it's slow fishing, it's same thing. I'm trying to apply my swim baiting to my conventional fishing. Now think about what works really well um, as it progresses into pre-spawn, your jerk baits, your spinner baits, you start getting fish that are more aggressive. Well, naturally, that's when I get into my glide baits, like traditional glide baits, like a Depths 250, um, or even my Hinkle Shads or Hinkle Trouts. It's a, it's a, it's a more of a glide bait that I can work like a jerk bait, not necessarily a chop where it's turning on itself, but these glides that are working just like a jerk bait, just like you'd snap a, a Vision 110 plus one, or you know, you're know, you getting that jerk bait style action. And as the water warms up, what, you know, what are you throwing? You're throwing more of your top water action. And that's when I go to my more serpentine style baits that are, you know, like a triple trout, a bull shad. Um, you know, I, I've got these other ones right here that are uh, rods go everywhere yeah rods go everywhere <laughs> here here it is right here you know like this is your you've got the six sense traces or a sweet baits herring or you know a, a spro shishimi when the when the water's getting really warm and those fish tend to get more aggressive in that 70 degree the herring spawn shad spawn i'm going with a lot of those whew, 
baits that swim just like a little shad. And then once again, as the water progresses even more, I'm starting to throw walking baits. So I get into my chop style baits. And then you see that transition back into fall when that water starts cooling, what starts playing again? Your jerk baits, mm -hmm. spinner baits, that stuff. And I go back to that Depths 250, Hinkle Shad, Hinkle Trout, and I'll even throw a Serpentine bait too because I can parallel it. Um, and then once again, that late, late winter, I get right back into those wedge tail soft swim baits that are super simple actions, parallel and docks, getting out on points and so forth. So when I think about choosing the right swim bait, I think about how what baits am I fishing conventionally and what swim baits mimic that same style action with conventional tackle. And that's that's this the is, deal. This is money. This this money stuff right here, folks. This is stuff you ain't gonna find anywhere else. I'm sorry. Yeah, so <laughs> I'm excited. Yeah, man. So that's <laughs> that's what what I'm thinking about. And we've been on a bite. I mean, it's crazy. A lot of people are always like, they know the Dream Catchers Fishing Channel, and you can go over to our YouTube channel. And it'll blow your mind how many fish we catch in single days on, on chop style glides and glide baits, you know, and it's all about applying, like you got to just think about just applying the action to time of the year. And then once again, just keep it natural, match the hatch and so forth. Sweet. So uh, trick shad, is, Whoa. That, is that a chop style? Or is, I know that's a little Dude, different. this is kind of a hybrid bait. Yeah. So the trick shad, I love Mike, Mike Buca. Oh he, boy, I have to, I have to show so him some love. So this is unique because you would think like it doesn't have that crazy angle so you would think maybe a glide bait but because of how free that joint is it acts like a serpentine bait when i burn it it goes <laughs> when i slow it down i can i can get really quick tight sharp chops uh man this bait is really unique i mean you could zoom in on just like yeah, the eyeball and like the, it's kind of, it might be hard to see in the deal but they're just so much tooth rash and uh, obviously hook rash, but tooth, like tooth marks mm. all over that bait. But this is kind of a hybrid bait. Now here's the deal. One just, the one just broke right yeah, there. I'm about it. to spaz. <laughs> so look at this. Do you see, there's one thing I do with all of, all of my swim baits. Uh -oh. You guys, you guys see this front yeah. treble hook, front treble hook. I wrap a lot of lead on my baits i take i've got i get it at at our tackle shop carries it because we have a fly shop section but i will take lead wire like so and wrap the hooks and why is that our lakes one are very very deep lakes highland reservoirs and a lot of our fish hang out in that 10 15 20 foot zone on brush so i want to take that bait one sink it down the other thing is you are going to think that i'm borderline a crackhead or meth head at how fast i fish um, and i like to get my bait down i like to work it fast and what some swim baits do not th not this one necessarily i like i like i like how this thing fishes but there's a lot of deep brush too, but I like to work it fast. And I want to make sure naturally my rod tips above the water. So the bait wants to nose up. I want to keep that bait as parallel to the water surface as possible so to look make at, it look natural. Look at how much lead wire he wraps around that, that treble hook. Yeah, that is. But that only is, the front one. Do you ever wrap the back one? No, unless it needs some severe tuning, okay. which there are some swim baits that do, but no, because I always want to keep that chest down because naturally this bait is going to want to sink now like this. And as I work it, it's going to lift that nose. I'd never want this bait to come in like this and then go up and blow out. Yep. Not that that's a non-natural way, right? M a lot of fish swim up towards the top, but a lot of times I want to keep that bait just as parallel as possible. If I want this thing to come up, I can raise my rod tip uh, to, to bring it to the top, but most times I want to just keep it parallel with the surface. And the other thing is I want to keep it as vertical as possible. That's another reason why I like chop style baits. There's some baits and listen, Back to that question about action earlier, some baits have a little bit more of a role. Like I think about like uh, a high-powered herring or a gancraft have, the, have this have this like tilting roll action. Dude, I've caught a lot of giant bass on a gancraft 230, but this time of the year, I want my baits to stay very, very vertical because what happens is a lot of times they're they're going to be feeding up at it, and if this bait is rolling, yeah, the hooks don't even get in their mouth. That's exactly right. Where if it stays vertical. Yep. You know, so, uh, you know, all these baits, you think about the science of creating these baits, they've got micro balloons in the resin, they've got a lot of lead in the belly. These things are made to stay very vertical. So I'm just trying to keep this thing as vertical as possible. I'm, I'm obviously big on what I'm throwing. And I really feel like I've got some setups that are the most efficient 
deals. So the first thing is when I'm fishing subsurface, any bait subsurface, I'm going with fluorocarbon line. I'm in clear water reservoirs, highland reservoirs. I need to be as stealthy as possible. I, I believe these baits, just like an A-rig, they have, um, the fish stay very keyed into the bait. But the thing I don't like about braid is the, the, ee, the just, that's not a natural noise for me. <laughs> yep. And I just, I'm like, I just don't like it. So I try to keep a smooth line. When I go with my top water baits, like right here, I've got a big rat on, right? This thing's pretty sweet. I've got that on monofilament, like a big, it's actually copolymer. So technically it does have some sinking. But it still floats real. It, it floats higher yeah. than fluorocarbon. Yeah, copoly sinks really, really slow. Yep, yep. So I'm going with fluorocarbon. The next thing is with all these rods, I want a rod that's got a, a moderately stiffer tip, but I also want a rod that bends way down here. Like you can see, like I'm barely bending that thing and it's bending down into the handle. So I've got a tip to be able to work the baits. But when I, when I hook these fish, they, all these rods have big parabolic bends. So this is a, uh, Kage. This is the seven foot nine Kage by Daiwa. I'm a really big fan of, uh, Daiwa. This is, a uh, Tatula 150. I've got Tatula 200s. Um, you know, once again, all fluorocarbon, but this one's a Kage seven foot nine. This one's rated for up to like five ounces. So with, with reels, yes. Are you worried Ooh. about spool size and that kind of stuff? So I'm not necessarily worried about spool size. I get a lot of guys, you'll get the hardcore swim baiters and they're like, it needs to be a round reel and a five, three to one gear ratio. I don't fish like that. I'm not I would saying choke myself with a five. I one. would too. I, and I'm not saying they do it wrong, but I'm just saying I like to pick up line way faster than most people. So I'll pick up line and I'm fishing it fast, the whole shebang. So I want a full spool. There's no need when I think about making a bomb cast. I mean, these things hold 120 yards of, of 20 pound. So you want a deep spool that holds a lot of line. Yeah, but yep. to me, like that, they make spools that are super, super deep that'll hold yep. like 200. And I'm just like, I just have no need for that. Right. If I have a deep spool, I'm backing half of it with braid, anyways, you know? So I'm going with 20 pound fluorocarbon. Uh, you know, I, you don't need a super deep spool. In fact, I think you can honestly get away. And how we're fishing these things, it's around a lot of structure cover, very precision cast. So, you know, I, I don't need just tons of line, but I do like heavy duty reels. So Tatula 300, I've got a Tatula 300 on that booger. That's a big, big reel, um, you know, 20 pound. So this rod, this I, is- I use the, the Z3 on mine. Yeah, I'm- The I'm, Concept Z3. Yeah, I wanna see, yeah, that's a that's a heavy duty. It's got, like, a, it's got 42 pounds of drag on it. Yeah, that's a Mac Daddy reel. I was yep. curious to see how it, how, how, uh, how it goes today with it. I yep. mean, I've heard some good things about them, but, um, you know, that's, that's the deal. You can use a 300 size spool like that one. Mm -hmm. I'm okay. This is a saltwater 200 edition Daiwa. Well, that's good. Uh, to, that's good to know. Cause everybody always says 300 size spool. Da, 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 da. I'm, like, I'm, I'm, I'm one of these guys. I'm like, listen, you will never hear me say there's one way to do it. There's <laughs> multiple ways to do it. I'm not even brand like loyal. I like my Daiwa reels. They're all metal interior gearing. They're bad to the bone. Um, you know, but I mean, I've got like five different rods. I've got a Dobbin 795. Uh, this rod right here, unbelievable. Once again, good little tip. It has a lot of bend into the backbone. Cause like I said, you want to be able to work the baits, but when you hook a fish, it's a treble hook bait. So naturally those fish are going to be head thrashing, jumping, going crazy. You want a rod to have some of that parabolic bend when you're fighting the fish, you need your rod to absorb those head shakes. And when you're talking about two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven, eight ounce treble hooked lures, <laughs> the rod you're throwing it on is unbelievably important. I've made that mistake, dude. Yep, me too. Like, I, had a, I had a nine inch bull shad literally come the fish bit. It was about a nine pounder. I set the hook, he came out and the bull shad came straight at my leg and hit me right square in the leg. Yeah. Nine, nine inch bull shad. Yeah. So Just nuts. Brutal. But anyways, those are my rods. Uh, this one's a Spro KGB rod. That's a Daiwa Kage. This one's a 795 Dobbins, another 795 Dobbins. This is a uh an 806 champion so you know that's what, what that's the deal li uh, line weight what what size line i pretty much always 20 pound you can get away on your smaller glide baits with like a 17 or 18 pound but i believe listen gene you're going to fish with me today you'll you'll understand why <laughs> i believe in the kiss method keep it simple stupid i ain't very bright i just like to winch them in with big line and boat flip them yeah, what knots do you use oh great question double san diego jam 
So it has three tag ends, which is going to trip some people out. It trips me out. But uh, <laughs> I'll, how about this? I'll just tie it really quick. This is the strongest knot. This, I remember when Buka first showed me the San Diego Jam 100 this, years ago, and I'm like, I'm never tying that sticky thing. Look, this isn't opinion. <laughs> this is fact. This is the strongest knot. You take your line, and you double it, just like oh. you would a Palomar knot, oh, right? I'm going to zoom in. There we go. You go through the eye, just like that. So now you're doubled up. You'll then pinch about four inches up, and then you go around the bait, I, or around that, uh, I'll go five times. So one, two, three, four, five. I then have this bottom loop right here. I'm gonna take my line and go through that bottom loop, and then look, where I'm pinching, I've got a top loop. I go through that top loop, I'll pull it like so, I lick it, lube it up, and then I'll pull my deal. And it doesn't burn when you pull it like that? When you lube it up like that, son, okay. that's 100% loogie. <laughs> so then I've got just those tag ends, just like that. Take my cutting pliers, take that deal. And that knot right there is these, I'm telling you, it's, if I set the hook on your bumper going down the highway, I believe your bumper might be pulled off your truck. He's going to teach me a new knot today. Yeah. All right, so what we're going to do now is we're going to get out on the water. We're going to show you guys. I'm not going to show you. Let me stop saying we. Austin is going to show you guys. He's going to do some showing, I assure show you. show me how to work these things because that's always the most confusing thing. I get out there and I start casting and I'm like, am I working this right? Am I working it wrong? Because it's just so unfamiliar to me. And so, and I know it is to a lot of you guys. So let's get out on the water. Let's get Austin up throwing his bait around and I'm gonna pick his brain about what and how and how we're supposed to do this. So. One of the things I really wanted to show is, I want you guys to notice and look at the things that he's throwing to. He's throwing all the way to the bank. He's throwing along the bank. We're paralleled pretty close to it. But uh, you gotta remember though, he's a guide. He's used to having people out of the back of the boat. So if I was fishing by myself, I would literally be even closer <laughs> That's true. Than, than he is right now but um look at the way he's working his rod yeah okay? it's a it's a mix of of rod tip and reeling and you can look at that bait dance inside chop 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 and i'm trying to really provide as much side to side action with that bait look at that thing just zipping it's just like a walking bait is is how i'm thinking about it but it's a perfect cadence of tip and reel with these chop style these chop style glides, but someone might fry me. You know, see, so he's not scared to throw around trees and that kind yep. of stuff. And I'm, you know, I'm controlling that bait. I'm, you know, I, I'm obviously, I have so much experience with this bait. I know how I can work this thing. And I can, if I cast outside of a dock, I can take it and glide it back into a dock. I always worry about the long handles. Of course, I'm a kayak fisherman, so that's, oh, that's yeah. part no, of it. No, I, I have, I don't notice a difference. Yeah, I got to figure out whether I want, I'm probably going to end up fishing them standing up most of the time like I do a fluke because you're working it just like I do a fluke. Yeah, so. yeah, it's very similar to a fluke. Yep. Very and similar. I, I can work. Oh, oh. oh, there's a big one. God, you just see that one roll yeah. on it. Holy cow, he just missed it. He didn't even touch it. That was like a four pounder. So, you know, I think like I literally just said, this is what I think about when I think about big swim bait fishing. We have access to deep water, big fish like that. A fish can move up and down on this bluff style wall and if a bait fish or something comes by and once again these fish are efficient they want they're like a, they're like old people old people want to be efficient with their energy old fish big fish want to be efficient with how they feed they don't want to go chasing little herring out there if they can hang out on a wall wait for a big gizzard shad big herring big bluegill big crappie or something to swim by but there's a lot of little nooks and crannies these fish will get in and kind of ambush you can see the shiners like literally you see the shiners following it off yep. the bank they think it's mama that's always a good look a good a good sign right i always used to love watch having the the bluebacks hitting my spinnerbait blades oh I'm yeah like, all right we got bait here mm -hmm. really want that sun to come out a little more i actually think the sun is going to help help our bite today why do you say that so i one we're on a herring lake and naturally i think the sun <laughs> helps the herring get up in the water column and it, you know the the big bass the big bass know to use the surface of the water like a wall so one is that but the other thing is this lake they just feed better in the sun i mean it well just, it's for the few of you guys that um let me get get myself on this shot 
the few of you guys that, that fish herring lakes understand that a herring is a, a pretty much a tropical fish, loves the sun. You know, like a, like a, a Florida strain bass loves the sun, but a herring, when the sun comes up, it moves shallow. It moves shallow in the water column. It may not move up into the shallow waters, but it will move up shallow in the water column and, and the bass will come out of their, out of, go out of their way to chase them. It's like, they're like cotton candy to bass. Yeah. And so just understand that that type of bait fish, your best days are gonna be your super cloudy or super sunny days with some chop on the water and you're gonna catch them. It's just the way it is with blueback herring and also blue, blueback herring work or move faster than other bait fish. Mm -hmm. And so you Which can is get why by I'm... with jerking, it's like you're jerking. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. So when I'm fishing a, a, a walking bait on a blueback herring lake, I'm working it as fast as I can work it. On one that has a shad lake, I'm gonna slow it down just a little bit. You're still gonna get the jerking. Oh, there's a, there's one right there underneath that that float. He just kind of came out. Yeah, he's there. He is. I see him. He's poking his head out. So I, I wouldn't have saw that fish. He kind of come out and then just like I don't know about yeah, you. And he ain't that, he ain't very big. No, but. you ain't you ain't the one. He, he was right up under that float, and all you saw was just his head poke out. Yeah. So. All right. So question. Yo. What do you what? Uh, when do you slow down? What causes you to slow down? Well, what, what causes me to slow down is the lack of activity, right? So we've already had a, a one pounder and we've been fishing for 50 yards. Had a one pounder, just kind of chase it. Had a four pounder, totally roll it and miss it. So immediately I'm thinking, okay, these fish are in a positive mood. If they're not in a positive mood, I'm, I'm going to slow down. And what I'm gonna do, honestly, on this specific lake, I can, I can tell you, I mean, I've been guiding out here for a decade. I kind of know you know, when, when the deal's on and when it's not on. But if they're in a negative mood, I'll tend to back off, I'll get on points and I'll, I'll go to some deeper presentations or even let this thing sink or go to a soft, a soft swim bait, uh, something like that. So, all right. So I'm going to talk about the visual bite. One of the things I've learned, um, myself over the years is that a visual bite also means that you're going to set the hook too early a lot. Oh yeah. Kind of like top water. I always tell you guys, if you see the bass bite your bait, give it a second and a half to two seconds before you hammer it home. And you won't jerk it out of their mouth so much. This the hard baits and big baits like this, you want to set it a little bit faster, but still you want to make sure that they have it in their mouth because nine times out of 10, you're going to jerk it out of their mouth too, too quick when you set the hook, hook right, right away. So just count. You know, just give it a second and a half to two seconds before you set the hook. That is true. And you will catch, you will hook more fish. So let's talk, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what I've learned by just watching this. Is the only wrong way to fish this is, is slow. It. Yeah, yeah, it's not fishing. <laughs> it's not fishing it. It, it's so it's not it's going to be all in my head when I'm getting when I'm when I'm jerking it around. I don't have to think about am I doing it right. I more have to worry about am I doing it the one way wrong yeah you know which is to do what you see everybody else do slow bling, bling, and you can bling. do that and you're going to get followers doing that but yeah. my my thought behind it is the big fish although i'm like they want to be efficient they are aggressive big fish don't get big by being you know like non-aggressive like they will eat if they get the right presentation thrown around them you know so. what about the cost i mean I mean, yeah, you can dump a lot of money into swim baits, but is there some, are there some good inexpensive options and what is an inexpensive option? You know? Yeah. You know, I'm a, the first glide bait I ever caught a fish on, it was a giant. It was an eight and a half pounder. I caught it on a river to see S waiver. S waiver is a great bait, you know, and obviously when you think about cost, it's relative. You know, I think a lot of people are like, Hey, I don't want to put a ton into my setup, but uh, you know, the, uh, the S waiver is a freaking awesome bait, you know, for the money. The and I'm gonna leave the link to all this stuff down, the, in, in my, in, down in my affiliate link. Yeah, the, the Storm Arashi is a great bait. Um, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of those baits are, they're budget friendly, uh, you know, and you can tinker with them. Uh, Sixth Sense makes a great, the draw, they make the draw in a couple sizes that are really good. There, that's a proven glide bait. What so. size do you recommend at first? I always want to go bigger. Okay, so you know, eight inch the plus? Eight, eight inch, nine inch, there you go. There's a couple little ones that just yeah. followed it out. But yeah, the eight inch, nine inch naturally, like I said, I just landed on a rock. On a rock. Um, 
you're going to get more draw, it has more drawing power, you're going to get more followers. The more followers you get, the more chance you have it, a fish going to eat. That's weird that it like hung in the rock. Yeah, it's on top of the rock. There isn't even anything there to get snagged on. There we go. <laughs> Dude, there's so many little baits so, ship shallow. Yeah, you know, I know with reels, there's a there's a price point that I, uh, you know, a low price point that I stop at. I don't go below seventy five dollars on a reel. You know, if I'm if I'm recommending a beginner reel, yep, I tell people don't go be below seventy five dollars because you're going to get a reel that's going to be frustrating. It's not going to work right, and so on. So, what about with swim baits? What's your bottom? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. There's some knockoff stuff. You know, I'm like. That knockoff stuff kind of bothers me. Yeah, you can I'm, not get, a, I'm not a knockoff fan. You can, you can get into that crap, but I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm I a big fan like of my beginner swim baits. Those, that $40 price point's a great price point. Okay. Uh, you know, give or take 10 bucks or so. Um, and then, you know, even I would consider a couple of the, a couple of the, they're definitely more expensive. Like a draw is going to be closer to like 90 bucks. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, I would still consider that not necessarily a beginner bait, but just a more cost efficient bait for someone that's just getting into it. You know, something like this darter or something like the, oh, I'll tell you, uh, you want to know like best swim bait ever for cost efficiency, 100% is the DRT baits. DRT. So these ones right here. And the reason is. Oh uh, yeah, that's the one you recommended for, for uh, uh, yes, Damon the other day. because I can put a bill in it and make it like a big crankbait. Mm -hmm. I can take the tail and flip it. It's, it has three different, I'm sorry, four different lips, three different tails, and all of those combinations are different actions and everything, which is really unique because when I think about, so check this out, price per action. If I get a $100 bait that's a glide bait, what does that bait do? It glides, so I pay $100 for one action. Well, this bait is $100, and I can get 25 different actions out of it. So now my price per action is four. Hmm. I get $4 per action, and they're totally different and have totally different reasons, water temperatures, everything, different actions. So that bait right there, as far as beginner, people are like, oh, it's $100, it's kind of pricey. That bait right there, unbelievable. And, and listen, we're one of we're one of like three exclusive dealers of, of those. So you can get those at dreamcatchersfishing.com on our on our personal. That'll website. be in the description too. The thing is, our water is so clear on these lakes, dude. If there's a fish and he wants it, he's going to at least follow it or yep. chase it or something. So I don't need to be super thorough. I mean, they're gonna come out and 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 eat it or they're not. So that, that brings like, look, at this, look at this. Look, I mean, there you go. There's a, there's a fish right there. So, so that brings up a topic. What is the water clarity that you would not fish? When do you not I fish? I think them? I would still throw a glide bait. I would, but I would be a little more uh, pick it apart, okay. essentially. Still yeah. fish high percentage stuff. So like, you know, our lakes are all floating docks. It's clear water. So a fish on that back corner can see a bait that's over here. Yeah. So maybe if the water was dirtier, I would still, I would still fish probably this fast in the sense of like how I'm working the bait, but I would slow down and be like, okay, I'm working this side of the dock. I'm working this float. I'm working that float. I'm working that float. I'm working that tree. I'm working that stump, maybe this side and that side. So that's probably the only time I, I would slow down because dude, if you think about it, have you guys ever seen a, a gizzard chat or a, a herring zip by the boat? I mean, it's like lightning dude. Yep. And whew, I mean, that's how fast those bait fish swim. So the fish are used to seeing bait fish at that speed. It's just a matter of presenting obviously you know in the right area yeah my thought is like you know if i if it was if it was stained to the point where it was only like two foot visibility i probably wouldn't if i couldn't get in tight to the cover and stuff like that i wouldn't throw it but if i can get within that two foot visibility now muddy water is totally off the i'm not going to fish it in muddy water just because i'd rather i'd probably rather choke myself <laughs> as close as you're going to have to get it to dock post and to Oh to stuff. my gosh. Yeah, you're going to beat up some glide baits if you Yeah, you're, you're going to get hung up a lot. So, that's one of the things. But yeah, my my thought is, is if the bass can see it, they're going to chase it. You just got to get it within the distance and the, the that they can see it. I actually think in, in dirtier water, I've had fish eat the bait oh, yeah, better yeah, cuz they don't get a good as that's good exactly, a look at so it. So they're like, "Oh, that's a gizzard chat." And they just and yeah. they inhale the whole thing. Where in clear water, like for instance, I just hooked that one on that back dock back there, not a big one, but he saw he saw it and then he just kind of swiped at it. In muddy water, dude, or dirtier water, there's none of that swiping. It's like, "Oh, there's a gizzard chat. I need to eat." Yeah. Oh my god. Oh, it's a big one. Of course I was. That's wasn't, a big one, dude. I wasn't recording it. That's okay. hooks into a giant. That's a giant. 
He freaking T-boned it, baby, like a four pounder. Oh, oh man. Oh, that might be a five pounder bite. <laughs> That's so good. Okay, so what he did was he put down the, what were you throwing? I put down the darter and I picked up the, the, trick, the trick shed. shed and literally, dude, that wasn't my third, second cast with a trick shed. Wow. I know I love to show Buka some some love, some bullshit dude, love. But that is a tank. Look at that. He for ate this it lake. Too. I didn't get it on video, but he got it on his hat cam, so I'll get the footage from him and oh, do all man, that. Oh man, that is a stud. Good gosh, look at that. That's thing. a five pounder on our Lake Highland Reservoir, baby. That's a that's a big bass. <laughs> Thick too. I like this time of the year. They uh they start to they start to girth back up. And I got my tripod all in the way, guys. That's why I'm having a hard time keeping this thing. So look at there, 20, 20 and almost a half inch fish. Four. Four and a half. Four and a half. He got, Easy. He he big eyed it, thinking it was five pounds and stuff. Oh, it was five pounds with the bait in his mouth. <laughs> so there you go. I mean, sweet. Four and a half pounder. That's the right frame, and that's the power of glide bait. And I mean, I know you may have not seen all of them. I got them all on the hat cam, but I've had three or four eat it and not hook up or barely hook up or even just miss the hooks. But you know, just like that, you just kind of keep doing it. And here's the deal. We still, I, we hadn't been out for 35 minutes. You know, if I can put one fish like that in the boat every 35, 40 minutes, you're gonna have a 22 and a half, 25 pound bag, 20 pound bag. So pretty sick. Sweet.